Okay, this is part two of the transducers. This portion will cover chapter 15. Okay, and what we'll be looking at here is light emitting diodes, which are not a transducer, but that's where they cover them at in this chapter. Uh, we'll be looking at liquid crystals, which are not transducers, but we'll be looking at those in this chapter. Uh, the rest of them are uh, photo re uh, photodiodes, we'll be looking at photoresistors, uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, which we've already looked at, excuse me. Uh, and then we'll be looking at some of your other sensors through the beam. I should have moved that into this chapter, but that's okay. So light emitting diodes, when holes and electrons combine at the junction of a forward bias diode, energy is released in the form of protons. Now pro protons are light. Now the problem is, is that silicon takes a very low VF, it takes a lot, a lot less energy, and the photons comes out at a wavelength that we can't see. So normally we cannot see the photons coming off of a silicon or germanium uh, tran uh, heat junction. So in normally they so normally they encapsulate these in an opaque uh, uh, package anyway. So for this reason, LEDs are not made from silicon. They're not made from silicon uh, from germanium. They're made from another semiconductor called gallium. Uh, so we make these out of doped gall gallium. So this is what's going on here. This is the way an LED works. So what you see is you actually have to have sight of the PN junction. Uh, so if you get a really good magnifying glass, you're not going to be able to see very much, but you could actually see the PN junction inside these things. Uh, contrary to popular belief, the color of the lens does not determine the color of an LED. The lens only, enha lens only enhances the color of the light emitted by the PN junction. Uh, the color emitted by an LED is determined by what we dope the thing with. So, and also the, the lens determines how we distribute the light. We have diffu diffuse lights, we have direct light, we have different types of lenses we can have depending on how we want the, the light coming out of the LED to be distributed. So these are some of your uh, of, of your doping. So we got gallium arsenide. This creates a light around 900 nanometers. Now light moves in 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 a in a of wave. It moves in a, like AC. It moves in a and it has a wave. But these guys move so fast. They're up in the gigahertz. But normally we give light in uh, the light in something we call nanometers, which would be basically the distance of the period. Uh, so when you look at waves coming in off the ocean, uh, they come in at a frequency, but they have a space between them. Or if you take a rope, a loose rope, and, and move it up and down, require, it'll create a wave. Uh, that wave will have a frequency, but also we have a distance between the waves. Or the period literally has a distance. Now light, this distance is given in usually what we call nanometers. And uh, then if you looked at a light chart, they would tell you the frequency, but a lot of light charts are giving you, give you the color of the light being mid, emitted. And, and different wavelengths give you different colors. So uh, nine, a 900 nanometer wavelength would, would, would be infrared, which means we can't see. Now infrared is used a lot. We don't want to see it. Uh, one of the most popular places used for infrared uh, for uh, gallium arsenide LEDs is in remote uh, remotes. Uh, wireless remotes that you use for your TV, for your VCR, your, not your VCR anymore, your DVD, you know, uh, all these are usually infrared or gallium arsenide as LEDs, and you can look straight at the end of those things and you can't see them flashing. Uh, gallium arsenide phosphate emits a, about a 660 nanometer, which is a red light. Uh, gallium uh, phosphate, gallium dope with phosphate, we should be saying, produces a green light, a gallium nit nitrogen, uh, creates a blue light, gallium arsenide, phosphate, gallium phosphide, uh, 630 man, uh, nanometers produce an orange light, gallium arsenide, phosphate, gallium phosphide uh, creates a 585 nanometer wavelength, which is a yellow light. Uh, so this light that I have over here, this LED that I have uh, right here, this is a yellow LED, okay, and of course uh, the, the lens is yellow, not because it determines the light and it enhances the light that's being produced by the by the uh, by the uh, by the uh, P injunction itself. 
So these are all different types you can buy. Now, originally, we had very few colors. And what's nice about this is they try to give you the actual colors over here. Uh, so these are up in infrared. You can't see these guys. And then here we start getting into red and orange and light orange. And then we get into yellow and blue. And then we get into blue, uh, which thank goodness, uh, because we have four prime colors that we use to produce all other colors. And those are red, green, blue, and black. So this is why we can put these big old displays out on the side of the interstate because all we're using is displays and all we're using is those three colors. When I get back from Germany and we get back into class, I'll get my magnifying my uh, microscope and we'll put it up in front of one of our uh, in front of one of our displays and let you look and see these three colors and realize that these three these four colors are produced in all your colors. Uh, and by the way, uh, we have what we call high intensity too, uh, which basically uh, this comes up and says, okay, uh, this would be blue. Uh, this is 470 nanometers. Uh, this is super blue. Uh, this would be the four voltage drop of that. So these guys are not, these guys are not silicon and they're not germanium. Why they produce more photons is it makes more, takes more energy to uh, overcome the barrier voltage. We do not use these guys for rectifiers. We use them for indicators. They have one purpose in life and that's all. But they're saying, okay, uh, this will be the number of lumens that I get out at 20 milliamps. So they don't use very much current. They produce lumens. And of course, some of your high intensity would, would require a lot more than 20 milliamps, but it still will produce a lot more lumens than an incandescent light would be. This is the symbol of a LED. Now, normally uh, the, the the circles round it. This is part of the symbol, but 99.9% .9 of the time they're not going to draw the circle. In fact, I've seen them draw it without the lines. But this should be the symbol that you see most often. Now, these guys to make them work, they have to be forward biased. Uh, which means we have to make the cathode negative in respect to the uh, anode in respect to or we can make the anode we can make the anode positive in respect to the cathode And then they have a VF. To turn them on, we have to exceed the VF. Uh, so this diode I was looking at right here, let's say I've got a orange LED. Okay, this guy right here. That means the VF is 1.8 volts. Okay, and then of course this guy right here wants to operate, so VF at 20 milliamps. So odds are if we put 50 milliamps through it, to intensify the LED, right? You understand? Uh, I'm going to look at this 20 milliamps, and it's going to drop approximately 1.5, 1.8 volts. So that means what I would do, uh, just like with this, is I would have to come over here, and if I'm going to use these things, I'm going to put a resistor in series with it. And then I would come over here, and of course, in this situation, uh, we'd put the cathode toward the negative and we'd put the anode toward the positive. Hopefully I'll realize the symbol of a battery, the long lines represent the positive, the short lines represent a negative. And then normally we put more to indicating that it is a battery because a battery consists of two or more cells, right? You understand? Now this is a symbol for a battery, but also now we use it as a symbol for basically basically any DC source, uh, whether it's uh, batteries or, or whether it's sales or batteries or whether it is an electronic source like we have on our train. So what I would do is if, if this right here is 10 volts and this guy here drops 
this guy takes 1.8 volts to turn it on, then right here, we're going to make this resistor drop 8.2 volts at 20 milliamps, because that's what it was rated at. And then what I would do is I would either round it up or round it down. I would round it to the next standard value. I wouldn't round up. I would round down. I would round it to the next standard value, okay, depending on what, what the actual calculation was at. So these are all different types of displays. These are these big old uh, LED displays that we see out on the interstate on all over the place now. These are nothing but groups of LEDs. Uh, these are what we call seven segment LEDs. We still have a bunch of these. Uh, these are just LEDs in a bar. These are called bar displays. These are called star displays, and we'll look at these uh, later on and look at that. So basically, the VF of an LED is typically around two volts at a current around 15 milliamps, and this is what we use if we don't have the data sheet. If we ha and most LEDs will work at this level. They might not work as bright as they're supposed to be, but they will work. But what you need to do, if you've got the part number on the LED, what you need to do is you need to look it up. On, you need to look up and see what the VF is and what the IF is. When operating a cir uh, circuit with voltages greater than the LED's rated VF, and we run into these all the time, then a series drop in resistor is required. Another thing we need to understand is LEDs have a very low reverse breakover voltage, typically around four to seven volts. So that means we cannot use these in an AC, most AC circuits. If we break it over, it's going to be damaged, right? You understand either it's going to stop working altogether in reverse direction or it's going to be damaged. So what we can do, though, is we can come over here. Let's say I wanted to work this off. Let's say I wanted to work it on 120 volts AC. Now, you know 120 volts AC, uh, the peak voltage is actually 170 volts okay, for VP. But what I would do is I would come over here and I would, but I would calculate this for 120 volts. I would calculate that resistor for 120 volts. And then I would come over here and I would put my LED right there. And then I would come up here and in series with it, forward biasing, I would hook this up to a standard rectifier diode. Now, let's say it was a 1N4007. Well, the 4007 has a PIV rating of 1,000 volts. So what would happen now when it forward biases, the LED would come on. When it reverse biases, then this guy right here would block the voltage. I've also seen them come in here and uh, this guy here is designed to drop most of the voltage anyway. I've also seen it come over here where they have the LED like this. And then parallel with it, they'll put another, a standard LED a rectifier diode in this situation, in this guy right here. So what happens is the negative alternations bypass and is dropped across the resistor. <clears throat> the positive alternations would go this way. Both of these will protect the diode. So if you're going to use an LED and a voltage and a voltage that's above, I would do it in more four votes. Uh, then uh, in the reverse bias direction. Now normally we'd only do that if we put this in an AC circuit. Okay, if I wanted to, if I had a, uh, I was going to want to see if um, my lights were on out that uh, back and back or something, then I could use this. But I would have to protect that LED in the reverse bias direction uh, with a standard rectifier diode. Calculating series resistors is really hard, so I know we're going to have a series resistor. Right, you understand that. And I'm going to look up the VF. If I don't know the VF, then I'm going to use around 2 volts at 15 milliamps. I'm going to say, okay, if this guy here, it, it drops around. Uh, if I don't know it, I'm going to use 2 volts. I'm going to come over here and use 10 volts uh, over here applied to it, right? You understand? Uh, so this would be my source. Uh, then I would say, okay, I, what size resistor do I need? Well, I want that resistor to drop 8 volts at 15 milliamps. And that's what I would use. And then I would round the resistor to, this, to the closest standard. These guys are real, real easy to calculate those series dropping resistors. Now, the prime colors... 
uh, the prime colors for LED. So we use these for indicators all the time, all over the place. I mean, even on your your computer, odds are when you turn your computer on, a light comes on on your computer. Uh, you know, uh, if you got a regular computer. Uh, so we use these guys all the place as indicators. Uh, but what I can do is I can group these in what we refer to as triads, and I'll show that in a minute. Uh, so we have a red, and a green, and a blue. So triads are arranged in different ways depending on the display, and then blue. And of course these will be enclosed uh, in a black background. And then what we can do is we can put these out far enough or make them small enough so I can't even see them. And then I can turn them on, turn them off, and we can control the intensity of them really, really delicately. And we'll see these as all the colors. So if I was to come up here on my display and blow these up, blow a section up on this display that I'm doing this on, or even the projector that comes up on the board, uh, then what I would see is I would see a bunch of little lines like this, red, they might not be in this order guys, uh, green, and blue, and this would be, these would be on a black background. And what we can do by turning on these colors and getting them far enough back, so you know, right now this is red. That could be made up of hundreds of picture elements. Uh, it's just that they're so small we can't see them. But like I said, uh, when you come in, what I'll try to do, and I don't know if I can do this uh, on my camera or not. We'll give it a shot. It would surprise me if I can. In fact, I got a picture. I got it, uh, where somebody's blew it up. I'll show you all that. No, oh, I didn't put it in here. So I know I can't do that. I'll show you all that when I get back. So this is called a seven segment display, and we run into these all over the place. And we have two types of seven seven displays, and so this is a situation where they're not drawing them as LEDs because they run out of space, and we know they're light emitting out of uh, light emitting diodes. We have one we call a common anode, and you see why it's called a common anode. All the anodes are connected together. And then normally they bring it out on two sides. And then what we do on these is we turn these on with zeros or grounds or commons. So what we'll do is we'll come over here and uh, I'll draw it like this. And I'm just going to draw about three of them. And then normally what we do is we'll come over here and we'll hook this up to, let's say, plus 5 volts. And then what I would do is I would come down here and I would put a resistor on each one of these. Okay. And uh, remind me when you get back for me to show you what we call resistor packs. So these are resistors that are put in a single package. So anytime we have all these uh, resistors like that, instead of putting individual resistors, we can put a package up there that has a bunch of resistors in there. So what would happen if I put this to common, uh, and this guy right here turn on, if I didn't hook this up to nothing, or I hooked it up to plus five oaks, and it would go off. And if I hook this up to common, then this guy right here would turn on. But what we can do is we combine this into what we call segments. We call this seven segments and they're given names. So the segment across the top, we call it the A segment. And then we just come around it clockwise, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then the center segment would be, set, would be G. Now what I can do with this is I can turn these segments on and I can turn them off. And we have, these guys have been around a lot, a lot a long, so we have integrated circuits that do this for us. And in digital, we'll talk about this. When you take digital, we'll talk about this in more detail. 
Well, let's say I turn this guy right here off. And I turn this guy right here off. I should be doing this. Uh, let me do it in white. Okay. So I'm going to turn this guy right here off. And then I turn this guy right here off. And I'm just playing the number three, right? Or I could come up here and electronically uh, turn this guy here off. The A segment, right? I'll say that. And let's say I turn off the E segment. And I turn off this right here. And now I'm displaying the number four. So we can do this to display all our numbers. So when you're when when you're using the uh, the uh, the function generator back there, uh, it's using a seven segment LED display. Uh, when you use uh, what else do we have around here that uses that? Uh, so that would be the number four. Now we can do some letters. Uh, but we can't do all the letters of the alphabet, so they'll display uh, some strange-looking uh, things here. Uh, I don't see my... Uh, I guys had to pause my lecture a little bit. My PowerPoint presentation locked up on me. So here's my camera. I'll bring it up. Here's my 7 second display. Uh, by the way, you buy these with decimal points, so you'll have like a 7 common cathode, 7 segment, uh, common cathode, right hand decimal point, uh, left hand decimal point, or actually you can get them with both. Uh, I can't remember exactly what this is. Uh, I think this is a common, I think I got the uh, a common anode, so this is the LED, this is the one that I have out here. We also have common cathodes, so notice here it's basically the same thing. In fact, uh, there would only be a couple of numbers difference between the two part numbers, whoever you get them from, you get them from the same company. Uh, here the cathodes are <coughs> connected together. So normally what we would do here is we would turn these on with power or we'd turn these on with voltage. So I'd bring my inputs in here so I could control each individual uh, LED. Uh, we use these things all over the place. Uh, I'll probably try to give you all a demonstration of it when I get back, but you need to uh, also uh, you know, look at these when it comes uh, forward here. Uh, a triad, uh, well, talking about displays, we need to understand a few little things that the book doesn't touch on. Uh, first of all, uh, we call what we have a, what we call a, dry, a triad. This is a group of red, green, and blue elements, and then these are all going to be on black. We have, we, we have what we call a pixel, which most of y'all have heard that term before. This is a pixel, pixel element. So a triad or triads are controlled as a unit, and so these are a group of pixels or triads. A pixel is a group of triads that are controlled as a unit. Uh, all the triads in a pixel will be the same color. A pixel resolution gives us the size of the pic pixels, which determines the sharpness of the display. So this display on this computer is made up of triads, which are red, green, and blue. And uh, like I said, I'll show y'all when I get back, and we'll look at it with a with a nice microscope. But if I was to blow this up, any section, I would see a red stripe, and not necessarily in this order. I'd have to look, and then I'd see a blue stripe, and then I would see a green stripe. And these stripes, these little stripes, which there's thousands of them on this display, thousands of them, would be mounted on a black background. So 
So let's start off with the black background and then they put all those. And then what we do is we vary, we turn them on, we turn them off, we vary them. And it should be obvious if I wanted a red image, I would turn on the red. If I wanted the blue, I'd only turn on the blues. If I wanted the greens, I would only turn on the greens. What gets interesting when I start mixing red at a certain intensity and blue at a certain intensity or green and blue at a certain intensity, you know, the might have a, a low red and a high blue or something like that. But what we can do is we can get all the colors. <clears throat> So one of the things I'm going to come up here, I'm going to click on the display on this, and I'm going to go to the screen resolution, and that's what you're doing, is you're setting the size of the pixels, not the size of the triad, but the size of the pixels. So normally, I think we're on a 9 to 1 by something ratio. So what this number right here on your display is this gives you the number of pixels across a row. So rows run this way. And then this, the, the 768 gives you the number of rows. Now, these are the pixel resolutions that's available for this computer. Now, the higher resolution, what I found out this works for me, uh, the higher the resolution you got, the more pixels your computer's got to update and the slower your computer will run. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to choose a pixel resolution that meets what you need, right? You understand, so you can see and everything looks nice and pretty. And, but you don't want it. Normally, you don't go all the way up to the top. And normally, you don't go down all the way down to the bottom. And you can see why. Uh, so uh, it takes time to update. This is why when you go out and you look at a video, uh, it's usually very small and it's got a real high resolution. You blow that thing up full screen, then a lot of times you can see the little squares or the little pixels that make up the picture. And uh, a lot of times on on cable TV, you'll start having problems, and we call it we call it pixelating, where you can actually start seeing pixels drop out in your picture. I don't know, but they're, they're squares, you know, so you can actually see uh, see those things. Uh, also, what would be uh, determined would be the number of colors, but we don't have uh, colors available here. So this is what you're doing right here is you're setting the pixel resolution of the of uh, resolution. So resolution is a term we use for sharpness. So when we say high resolution, it means it's really, really sharp, which means it takes a bunch of pixels. Uh, this is why if you've got a digital camera, the higher your pixel resolution, the, the less pictures you can put on your camera because each picture, each pixel has got to uh, hold that color information in there for every pixel. That's in there. So, so uh, so this is where we come up with these big, uh, yeah, here's the picture right here. So this is basically the makeup of the pixels, and they the, they come up with an order. But red, somehow they're going red, red, green, red, blue, red, red, blue, green, red, red, green. And then this would be a little old tiny square up here on this image. And then they take these and they snap literally thousands of these together. And you can see where it gets the, uh, gets the uh, connector on the back. And then they use these three colors, these four colors, black, here's the black background, blue and green to create thousands of colors, uh, you know, thousands of colors. And these are what we see on the side of the road. So if you were to go up there and get real close, eventually you're going to start seeing the little individual red, green, and blue dots up there. It's just that it's back so far. Our eyes, it, 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 so the further you back for something, the smaller they get from, from your eyes. They don't change size, but they appear to be smaller, right? And we get this back where our eyes blend all these together, and we can do beautiful pictures just like we do uh, with these guys right here, these little old red, greens, and blues that this whole display is made up of to give me any color that I want to. Uh, and it takes a lot of electronics, but basically these are just big old computer monitors. So they're just big old computer monitors. So they basically run them just like computers. They can make a PowerPoint presentation and flash them up there just like they do on a computer screen because that's all they are. You know? a, a, a photo diode, this is a special purpose diode whose leakage current is controlled by the amount of light that strikes the peak junction. Uh, placed in the circuit in reverse bias, uh, uh, as the intensity of light goes up, the photo diode's leakage current goes up. So this is a symbol of a photodiode. Now, I'd argue that, so if I'm going to use a wireless remote to change the channels on my disc on my TV, I've got to use a sensor 
that senses the light coming off of my remote. Now, normally these are photo diodes or photo transistors, and we're not going to get into photo transistors right now. Uh, why don't we use photoresistors? Photoresistors respond very, very slow. I don't know if you saw that a while ago when I put my finger on over there. If I cover it up so fast and let it off, it takes a little while for it to stop. I want it to be instantaneous. So when you match that remote on your TV, uh, then what you're doing is you're transmitting out of a photo diode and you're putting a, a, a set of pulses on there. And that, that light pulse indicates that I want to change channel. And then another one might come up and be a higher frequency like this. And this might mean I want to, so this might mean channel up. This right here might be channel down. So it sends out different pulse streams to indicate what you're trying to tell your TV to do. Over on your TV, you might have a photo diode or you might have a photo transistor. This is picking up these pulses. And then this is going into the electronic circuits of the TV, which tells your electronic circuits to change the channel, to change the volume, to adjust the color, to adjust the U, you know, everything that you do on your remote. Your cable box has got the same feature. It's got a different code of streams. So let's say if they register those codes, it means that each remote puts out a different code. So that means I, I my, my DVR, my, my, my DVD, codes will not interfere with my TV codes, which will not interfere with my with my uh, cable codes, my cable box codes. Pretty neat, right? So these are photoresistors. I can turn my overhead projector off and on with one of these things. By the way, they're using infrared, so that means you can't uh, you can't you can't see them. They're out of the visible light spectrum, so you can't see them flash. Uh, I'll try to see. I got one of my cameras that can pick it up. Not not the camera on my t a TV. I'm almost sure uh, the camera up here won't pick it up. So I'll see if I can find that camera. So this is a typical photodiode circuit. We put it into the circuit reversed bias. Uh, I've got some photodiodes right here. Uh, these are pin photodiodes. Uh, and... Uh, We'll try to hook some of these things up. Uh, we'll try to hook them up all in a group uh, when I get back. And then uh, watch this work. Uh, so this is a photo diode. It looks like a regular diode. So just because you see it like this. By the way, LEDs have became integrated circuits. Uh, they, but they're really, really small. They have real high intensity. Uh, uh, so the LEDs I have are in this package like this. This is the package. These are the basically the, almost the same package that they're using on the big displays. Uh, but now we've got them uh, where when you look at the printed circuit board, there's just a little old pad down there, and when you turn them on, they light. You see they light up, and you can actually see the LEDs. Uh, you know, uh, which is pretty uh, pretty neat. Uh, this is the photo diode that we have. Uh, I think I have an experiment. Uh, last time we had it, we didn't have the experiment, so I think we'll try to uh, we'll try to inc incorporate this thing in the uh, in the experiment that we do on transducers. But we won't do our trans. This is a handout lab, and we won't do our experiments on transducers until uh, you get through with the uh, the uh, power supply, all the power supply labs. Uh, these are photoelectric sensors. So now you know we can transmit light. Now you know we can receive light. And light has some very neat properties uh, that make them used in all types of transducers. Uh, normally we use these in what we call proximity sensors, which means detecting when something is next to. So this is a perfect example of a photoelectric, photoelectric sensor. Uh, this would be an example of what we call a through the beam sensor. So what we have is we have a light source on one side emitting a light, shooting light beam across, and then over here we have a photo detector, which could be a photo diode or a photo transistor. It doesn't really make any difference to us. They do the same function. Uh, when this box comes down here and moves into the center, uh, then what's it going to do? Well, what it's going to do, it's going to break the beam between the transmitter and the receiver.
So now I know the box is present. So I can know it when it's present. I could say use this to count the boxes as we come down. Uh, but that's what we're trying to do. We got tons of these over here. So these are the basic ones that we have. I think I got a little better image over here. Uh, uh, we have this guy. This is called a through the beam. So uh, through the beam uh, uh, depends on a transmitter. And I don't know which one. We'll just call this a transmitter. We call this a receiver. And they're mounted across from each other. And we have to line them up. And then, of course, when the object to detect moves through the beam, it breaks the beam. And this is why it's called a through the beam sensor. Another type that we'll look at is called a retro reflective. A retro reflective is a is a mirrored surface that's made up of hundreds of these little triangles. So if I was to look at it from the top, this would be the dot, and we would have a triangle there. Now, what's nice about these is that these things reflect light. They try to reflect light back to their source. So if I was to use a mirror, then I would have to have perfect alignment of those. You see retro reflectors all the time of people that ride bicycles and walks on the side of the road or workers at night. They have retro reflective strips on their on their uh, on a vest that they put on. So even though you're off to the side, it still reflects back to your car as long as you don't exceed the beautiful angle. Uh, most of our street lines, most of our street signs have retro reflective paint, uh, paint on there. So you can see the reflection off that off that stop sign, even though the stop sign is mounted off to the right, it still reflects back at our car. Uh, these are what we call re retro reflective sensors. So what's happening is they're depending on the light to go over, hit the reflective sensor, and then do what? And then bounce back. Now these are a little cheaper, a little maintained. They're a lot easier to adjust, but they don't have the distance or the sensing distance of of the through the beam sensor. And uh, we have a lot of these on the manufacturing line over there. And what we'll do is we'll go over there and look at all these uh, photoelectric sensors. Uh, the other one what we have is what we call a diffuse sensor. A diffuse sensor shoots the light and literally bounces the light bouncing off or the reflective light off the object itself is what the diffuse sensor senses. So these guys here have a limited range, which a lot of times we don't want real long range. We want a limited range, right? Uh, so we don't want to see something off in the distance. We want to see something uh, close. Also, they have uh, problems with darker colors. So a lot of times if you've got a solid black object, these guys may not pick it up. Uh, normally, though, on all these sensors, we have what we call a sensitivity. adjustment where we can make it pick it. There's really no such thing as a solid black. We we can get close to it, but we can't have something that doesn't reflect any light at all. But black that most of the blacks we have uh, deflect a small amount of light. Uh, this is called an optical interrupter. And basically this is nothing but a through the beam sensor. This is an optical interrupter. Uh, this won't show up. Yeah, it does, uh, if I can get it in the light right. But one, we've got E. This is the emitter. we got one called D. This is the detector. Uh, this is nothing but a through-the-beam sensor. But what we have is we have this gap in the center. So this gap in center, we have a blade or whatever we're trying to sense, comes up and blocks this. And then, of course, that's going to break, break the beam, and we'll be able to detect it. Uh, this is uh, usually just a photodiode and a photoresistor, uh, so it gives you the plus and the minus, if I can get it back up there, if I can find it. So there it is. So this is plus right here. That's plus. So we have to put a resistor in series with these to limit the current, and we did, these are about the same thing. I'd have to look and see, but we could look this up. We've got a partner on this one, which would tell you uh, what DF is required and what current flow would be required. Okay, but this is called an optical interrupter. Uh, there's one more that uh, that uh, didn't make it. Uh, uh, we have a an IC called an opto isolator.
Now basically, if I took that gap out and put this inside of an integrated circuit, this would be an optical isolator. Now what we mean to do is we need, this is when we need to isolate an input from an output. Uh, this is true, uh, most programmable logic controllers use opto isolators. So that means I can come up here, right? And I'll put a resistor right here. And sometimes they'll put a zener in parallel so we don't exceed the rating of the uh, diode. And then what happens is I can come up here, and this is all inside the PLC. Then we run through an optical isolator. Well, what happens if I screw up and I put 10,000 volts right there, it's going to blow the optical isolator, but it's not going to blow my PLC. So that means my PLC is somewhat use, useful. It's not going to burn it up. I might be able to, if I got a spare input, I might be able to move over to the spare input. But what this allows us to do is totally electrically isolate different pieces of equipment. So I can turn, Alabama Power can turn power off and on with a computer by going through an optical isolator. So here would be your high voltage controls over here. This would be your low voltage controls over here. And your 1,000, 10,000 volts don't get back into your computer and blow it up. It might blow up the optical isolator, but it won't blow up your computer. So we, we use these optical isolators all over the place. PLCs use them on both their inputs and their outputs. So what this does, it, it isolates the electronics of the PLC from what you're hooking up to the thing and what you're controlling with the thing. So these are called optical isolators. They work a lot like an optical, inter uh, inter uh, optical interrupter. In fact, if I come up here and just enclose this whole thing in and you don't see the light going through it. Uh, these are called liquid crystal displays. I don't know why these were in the... Uh, in the section on transducers inside uh, the optical electronic device. But LCD displays are the neatest thing that was er almost ever invented because this allows us to do images on very, very small. Used to, what we did is uh, in TVs, we coated the surface of, the, of the, the front of the TV with different color phosphors, red, green, blue phosphors. And they were actually in a line with each other. So they were actually kind of offset from each other. So let's say I put uh, a red. And then on the next line down here, offset a little bit, uh, I put a green. And then down below it, uh, I put a blue. And then this would have been on the back background. And these had three different co colors that was actually put in stripes on the back of the TV. And then what they would do is they would put a mask or a screen grid behind it that isolated them into dots. And then what they would do is they would scan an electron beam and they would either turn it on or turn it off on top of each dot to get the three different colors that we talked about before. Uh, to focus the electron beam, we had this in something called a cathode ray tube. And they shot the beam out, and then they used magnetics uh, with what something they call a yoke to point the thing and make it sweep across and down. And these things were huge. I remember the first 24-inch computer monitor I saw, and I wish you could have seen the size of that thing because 24 inches mean, uh, by the way, uh, these sides are given measured this way right here. So when we say a 24-inch monitor, it would be 24 inches across this direction right here. And uh, we, we carried a standard ratio for years. Now we're going to 19-something. The ratio to the height to the width, the, the high definition has a different ratio uh, than the old CRTs did. When they came out with liquid crystal, uh, they realized that they could come up in control the liquid crystal with AC. So if I put AC across it, it, straight, it, it aligns itself vertically. If I take the AC away, it automatically aligns itself in a spiral that spirals 90 degrees. So what they would do is they would come up here and backlight these things, and then they'd send the light through a polarized lens. And I'd say they did. They do it now. This is the way they work. So here, no matter how the, the light is moving, 
when it comes up here, the light is in aligned in a certain orientation. So here I'm going this way, going through the polarized lens. Up here we have a second polarizer that's 90 degrees out of tilt. So notice these are this way, these are this way. So if I have AC on there, the light passing through this would be blocked by this because it has a different polarity. I turn the AC off with an electronic switch. Now the light comes up and follows this uh, crystal inside here and it twists by 90 degrees and now it's allowed to pass up out on the top. Then what we do, now this is really cool guys, then what we do is you, we make this strike a colored lens up here at the top. And that's what you're seeing when you look at a liquid crystal, when you look at a li li uh, liquid crystal display. So this would be green. So what's going to happen is this guy right here is going to glow green. Here, right here, it would be black. It would be turned off. Okay. So what we can do is we put AC off, take the AC off, it flips the things around, we see it, we take it off. So that's what these thousands of these little red, green, blues, red, green, blues, red, green, blues, red, green, blues across this display, that's what they're doing. They're made out of liquid crystal. The problem is, though, and they've got all the lenses on the back, they have the crystal, the the uh, L, uh, the liquid crystal metrics on the back. Now, originally, this guy, these guys have to be a back lid. Originally, they they lit it with one big old fluorescent light. Now, what would happen is if your fluorescent light went out, then your display went out. And I've got a whole bunch of them over here that the liquid crystals are work, working fine. If you look under the computer where the server's at, that's what's happened to every one of these. Well, eventually what they did is when they got high-intensity LEDs, they started lighting them with LEDs. So now, used to they call them LCD displays, now they're calling them LED displays, but they're still LED displays, it's just they're backlit by LEDs. And they use thousands of little LEDs. So if one of your little LEDs go out, you, odds are now you can't even tell them. And they last a lot longer and they, they uh, consume a lot less power than, uh, than liquid, than, uh, uh, than fluorescent bulbs. And you can tell them so you're, your LEDs, your your uh, LCD displays that's backlit by LEDs are going to be extremely thin, little old tiny things. So just about all your cell phones now use are, are backlit by LEDs. Uh, most of the monitors in the lab, but you can look at the monitors next time you're in the lab in the computer room. You can see some that's a lot thicker. Some of them are really thin. Some of them are really thick. The really thin ones are, L are backlit by LEDs. The real big ones are backlit by fluorescent tubes. And you can see, uh, we originally started out with all fluorescent tubes because we uh, bought, uh, equipped this lab with the computers uh, before uh, before uh, the LED uh, LCD displays were out. And I think we've got maybe five out of 20 are still using the fluorescent bulbs uh, because all the bulbs have gone out. Of it. Well, guys, that's it. That uh, covers uh, chapter 15. The, the, and like I said, I'll put this up at two different, uh, two different uh, part one and part two. Uh, wish y'all could have been here to ask questions. If you got any questions on these two parts, you need to go ahead and submit them by email. And I'll either email you to back directly or email the whole class back. I'll get back to this as soon as I possibly can. I'm pretty sure right now. Uh, most of our nights will be uh, free. We'll probably be looking for stuff to do. So if you send me an email, I'll probably get you back. We'll not give you back. We'll get. We'll not get back during the day uh, because I'll be in class. Uh, probably I think we get there. Our classes run from like nine to four, so I'll be in class every day except for the weekend. And I'll probably go sightseeing. And then Nancy will probably go sightseeing during the weekend. So hope y'all have a blessed uh, a holiday. Have a good break. Be careful. Uh, stay out of trouble or uh, just don't get caught, right? Uh, I'll go ahead and put this up and uh, the quiz will be up and it'll pop up. This will be the uh, first lecture. Uh, so this will be on the, when, uh, the 20th. And then the second lecture is going to be a pre-recorded lecture, which means I recorded that in another class. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to put a little note up there to tell y'all to ignore the dates and everything that I mentioned during uh, during those lectures because it's not going to be the right dates, but it's going to be uh, right out of the book. 
Okay, uh, this concludes the lecture. I'll go ahead and start the upload on this. And like I said, y'all have a blessed break, and I hope y'all can get through with this like me.